Today we're going to talk about a man named Gregor Mendel. And maybe you've heard about him or know who he is and what he did. Uh, anyone who has done anything with genetics absolutely knows who Gregor Mendel is because he's considered to be the father of genetics. He did a lot of very famous experiments in the mid 1800s that determined that the things that he did kind of led the way for the things that we learned last week. But before we get into all of that, let's talk a little bit about who Gregor was. So Gregor was born in the 1820s to a poor farming family in Austria. And back then, if you were born to a poor farming family, most likely you were gonna grow up and be a poor farmer. That's just kind of how it worked. But Gregor was in love with science. That was his passion. And what he wanted to do was be a science teacher. And especially he wanted to teach physics, which is pretty interesting considering that he's only known for genetics. Well, his family really supported him, um, both financially as much as they could and, and morally, they, they supported him. And so they were able to actually send Gregor to university. And that was a big deal in the 1800s for a poor farming family to be able to do that for their son. Unfortunately, a series of circumstances happened and the money ran out. And Gregor was faced with a really big decision. He was either going to have to quit university and go find a, a different job somewhere and forget about his passion for science, or he was going to have to find someone else to fund his education. Well, back in the 1800s, the best way you had for someone else to fund your education was to turn to religion and specifically to go into a monastery, become a monk. So that's what Gregor decided he was going to do. And he joined a monastery, he became a monk, and the monastery paid for his education. They sent him back to university so he could finish. And there he was studying physics. That was his primary focus and passion in life. Well, he got his degree. The next thing that he wanted to do was become a science teacher. And guess what? He failed the test. He couldn't become a science teacher which is you know, kind of interesting considering how now he's one of the most famous scientists that we, we have. Well, Gregor goes back to the abbey, which is the, the monastery, and starts working in the garden. And he still has his love for science and he's still doing sciencey things, but he's gardening. And he notices that on his pea plants, you know, peas, the little green things that you eat, a lot of the flowers were purple, but a few of them were white. And he, the scientist in him started thinking, why is this? Why are most of my flowers purple, but every once in a while a white flower pops up? Well, again, being a scientist, he decides he's going to go about figuring out why more plants are purple and less plants are white. So here's what he did. He starts breeding together his purple flowers. Okay, so he'd breed them together. Every once in a while, he'd get a white. If he'd get a white, he'd chunk that one out of there. And all he would breed was purple to purple to purple. And eventually, no matter how often he bred them together, guess what? Gregor ended up with a batch of pea plants that were purple all of the time. Every time he bred them, he got purple. He never got a white. All right, now he had a pure batch of purple pea plants and he was pretty pleased with his purple pea plants. Now, next job was, let's see if he could do it with the white. Well, he bred a white and a white together. Guess what? No matter how often he did it, he never got a purple. He always got a white. Interesting. So now he had a pure batch of whites and a pure batch of purples. Okay, great. Now what's he going to do with it? Well, the scientist in him says, what happens if I breed one of my pure purples with one of my pure whites? Now the thought at the time was not correct. The thought at the time was, if you took these two things and bred them together, it would just be this jumbled mix of the two, okay? So if you bred a purple and a white together, you'd get lavender flowers. Now we know that wasn't true. He never even had lavender flowers. Basically the thought was if you bred a black squirrel and a white squirrel together, you'd get a gray squirrel. We know that's silly now, but back then that's kind of what they thought. So he bred a purple flower and a white flower together. I don't know, maybe he thought you know, he might have given a hypothesis, an educated guess as to what might happen. Maybe he thought he would get 50% purples and 50% whites. That seems fairly reasonable, right? If you have purple plant and a pure white plant, you breed them together, maybe you'd end up with this ratio. 
But that's not what happened. He got four purple plants. Now this is what we call the F1 generation. When we breed, do our first breeding of plants together. Remember, he had a purple batch and a white batch. Both were pure. He took one from here, one from here. He bred them together. He got an F1 generation, all of the offspring from these very first parents. And like I said, all of those offspring were purple. Now how could that be? He knew that something in there had to be white because there was a white parent involved. So now he decides he's gonna create an F2 generation, which is what happens when you breed members from the F1 generation together. So he took one of his F1 purples, another one of his F1 purples, and he bred them together. Well, guess what he got this time? Did he get all purples? Did he get all whites? Did he get half purple and half white? No, here's what he got. He got three purples for every one white. So basically, the ratio that he saw come up time and time again was 75% purple to every 25% whites every single time. Three purples, one whites. Interesting. Now we'll go further with that later. But what I want you to know for now is once he got his pure purples and he got his pure whites and he bred them together, he got first off in the F1 generation, all purples. Then when he bred that F1 generation to each other, that's when he got 75% purples to 25% whites. Now, Mendel decided there must be something called factors that are involved. There's some kind of factor involved in causing this to happen. Causing, when you breed a pure white and a pure purple, some factor must be causing all purples to pop up. And when you breed that F1 generation, some factors are now causing a white one to pop in there. Well, back then he called them factors. Now we call them alleles. We learned about that last week, right? Now, it wasn't just color that Mendel focused on. He also focused on the size of the plants. Because if you notice here, when I put them all in the jar, not all of my plants are the same size. I have some that are short and some that are tall. Well, guess what? He went back and he did experiments with that same thing. So, he took and he bred for pure tall plants. Okay, we're gonna take the whites out now because it worked basically the same way with them. He bred pure tall plants. He kept breeding plants and breeding plants until every single one of them would turn out to be tall, like this one. And then he bred plants and bred plants until all of them would come out to be short. And once he did that, guess what he did? He took one of his pure tall plants, he took one of his pure short plants, and he bred them together. Again, when you breed them together, you're gonna get your F1 generation. And you know what he found? One, two, three, four. All four of them were tall. None of them came out short. Had his F1 generation. He bred two of them together to produce his F2 generation. Guess what he found out? One, two, three talls, one short. So again, there were factors involved that were causing the talls to be produced from the, the two tall parents, okay? Even if he bred a tall and a short parent together in the beginning, when he bred those together, he would get one, two, three, four talls then when he would take the F1 generation, breed them together, then he'd end up with three talls and a short. The short would come back in at that point. So Gregor knew he was onto something right now. He did a lot of research and, and realized that with his single traits, 
he would get the same ratio every time. When he would breed F1 generation to F1 generation, he'd get this three to one ratio back out. And he did some more research that we'll talk about next week. But for now, this is all you need to know about Gregor Mendel. We're going to now take all of this information into the wizarding world. We're going to go into Professor Sprout's greenhouse and see what we can do there.